Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 435 of the podcast and it's Friday the 14th of June 2019 as I record this in Bath. So today I'm talking about how to be an unskippable author with Jim Cookrell, uh, who you might know from the Sell More Book Show podcast, which is fantastic. So in a world full of distraction, how do we make ourselves unskippable? And the world is noisier than ever. So how do you stand out? How do you make sure your books are those that people line up to read, uh, digitally speaking? <laughs> So one thing particularly stuck out to me in this interview is that we are more distracted than ever, but once we find content we love, we're pretty loyal and we binge it and we become dedicated to that uh, until potentially we change our interest. But we might binge a whole load and really get into something and go deep. And this is definitely true for me in terms of the voices that I know, like and trust. I will keep going back to those voices in order to learn more because I, over time I've come to trust them. So I want to hear more from them. And my consumption, I was really reflecting on this, is is primarily audio. So I every day I'm listening to an hour or so more actually at the moment, just generally, well, <laughs> my husband's away. So I have a lot of time to listen to audio uh, around the house where I normally might not be plugged in. But um, podcasts and audio are my primary consumption, way more every day than TV or or even reading ebooks or print. So I will be listening like a lot of the time and then I will I might watch a bit of TV uh, with with uh, my husband when he's here um but and then I'll read a bit in bed. Uh, I always read on my Kindle before I go to sleep. Uh, but that's pretty much the only time I'm reading with my eyes now. Most of the time I'm listening to podcasts and audio. So it's really interesting to me as the world shifts again. Uh, and, I, you know, not that long ago, probably the end of last year is when I started when I, oh, no, it was Nink. It was really Nink last year. And I did a whole show on that. So September 2018, when and also when I found out more about Storytel, and I got involved with Findaway Voices, and realised the way the audio was going and it just made it clear to me even with my own behavior what was happening so I just wanted to challenge you as you're listening to the interview with Jim reflect on your own behavior and how you behave and how you skip through things and how you choose people to listen to or read and but also consider that you may not be your market so consider how others interact with the world and how you might reach them in these changing times So last week I mentioned that Barnes & Noble might be bought by Elliott Management, the same company that own Waterstones here in the UK. And it looks like that will go through as I record this. There was a cut-off date of yesterday night uh, for another buyer, but um, I've been checking the news this morning here in the UK and I haven't seen anything, so I'm assuming this is going through Um it might not, but it was pretty certain. And I also mentioned last week that I really didn't understand the euphoria. I mean, it, yes, we want bookstores to stay open, but the euphoria of the publishing industry seemed a little odd considering it just will mean that there is a decreasing pool of buyers <laughs> for books. And uh, that will impact the price that, that publishers are able to sell into the chains for. And I uh, wanted to mention the hot sheet this week. So the hot sheet is a fantastic... A subscription newsletter about the publishing industry for authors uh, run by the wonderful Jane Friedman and Porter Anderson. You can subscribe at hotsheetpub.com. And this week they do some commentary on the whole Barnes & Noble thing and uh, mention they quote Philip Jones from the bookseller here in the UK saying... Uh, James Daunt, so James Daunt is the guy they've put in charge. Uh, he... he 
has come up through the publishing industry after investment banking. <laughs> so, and uh, he turned around things here. But uh, Philip notes it wasn't all easy. He says, Daunt's first few years at Waterstones were troubled. He had pushed and largely, largely succeeded in getting extra discounts from all of the big publishers in return for culling paid for promotions, including the popular three for two deals on paperbacks. He also returned huge numbers of books after discovering covering 20 million pounds, around 25 million US dollars worth of worthless stock hidden in back rooms and under tables across the chain. And as a quote, Daunt was asked in Jerusalem, he was there on a trip and he was asked what he thought of Barnes & Noble when he went into a store last and he said, there were too many books. And it's funny because I feel exactly the same way about Barnes & Noble. Whenever I I'm in the US and I'm, you know, I'm there a few times a year. I go into whatever bookshops I'm near, whether that's an indie or a Barnes and Noble, or um, I've been into the Amazon bookstores in uh, New York. And I always feel that. I always feel like, whoa, it feels just dense. There's too many books. This is not displayed in a way that I enjoy. It's it's almost like a website page with no white space. It's too cluttered and I can't get value from it. So if you think about those comments and think about what that might mean for those Barnes and Nobles, for well, not necessarily for the Barnes and Nobles, but for those publishers, if he if he does some of the same stuff and just returns a load of books, that is going to be a big deal. So watch out for turbulent times ahead. I would also add that, um, again, I've seen these kind of Uh, happy, oh, the Brits are coming, life will be amazing uh, when British people rescue this American train. But not at all. So there is a New Yorker piece about the head of Elliott Management, the hedge fund who own, who now uh, will own all of these bookstores. It says, uh, this guy... Oh, I didn't write down his name. But anyway, the head of Elliott Management is an activist investor. So that means that they take a distressed company and make it profitable again and then obviously sell things on for a profit. But he's been called um, aggressive, tenacious and litigious, the world's most feared investor. (laughs) So I'm like, how is everyone just jumping up and down with glee? I mean, yes, I want the bookstores to be there, but um, let's just wait and see what happens. Uh, So I'd love to hear if you start seeing changes in your local Barnes & Noble um, pretty soon, then let us know. I certainly, as a reader, from the other perspective, I love Waterstones here in the UK and I shop there at least once a week. So um, I'm not worried as a reader. I think as a reader, it will be a much better experience. But I think it will absolutely impact the publishing industry and the authors who uh, currently have their books in. The other thing that happened, uh, F&W Media, who I reported uh, back a while ago, um, obviously... Uh, they own Writer's Digest and all the books that Writer's Digest publish. Uh, They went bankrupt and Publishing Perspectives now reports that Penguin Random House has bought the publishing assets. So a backlist of more than 2,000 titles uh, and 120 new titles annually. So it will be interesting to see what happens to the authors whose books have been bought as part of this deal, many of um, whom have our owed money from the bankrupt company, but they will probably never get that. Uh, But it's always good to reflect on these type of stories because when you license your rights to a publisher and then they go bankrupt, for example, whatever is in your contract will stand. And a lot of the times the rights will just get bought up as they have here, um, but sometimes they can revert to you. So definitely check your uh, contracts if this type of thing happens. Um, Yeah, you want to see how things are going to be if your rights change hands. And again, thanks to Jane and Porter at The Hot Sheet, which is fantastic. You can subscribe at a very reasonable price um, at hotsheetpub.com. Links in the show notes. A very brief futurist segment this week because tomorrow I'm actually going out, tomorrow as I record this, uh, will have happened by the time you hear this, uh, but I'm going to the Wired AI conference in London and very excited about that. Um, Marcus de Sotoy, who's been on the podcast talking about AI and creativity, he's a speaker and a number of other people uh, are speaking. So I will be doing an AI show in a couple of weeks time and we'll be talking in 
detail about all this. But what I wanted to point you at this week uh, in order to really understand how far things are moving, how fast things are moving, uh, just Google Zuckerberg deep fake. Um, so basically, if you haven't seen this, this is a video of Mark Zuckerberg, um, which is it, it's, it's been described as an art piece. <laughs> uh, but essentially, it's him, if you watch it, uh, or listen to it, it's him talking about what would happen if one man owned billions of people's data. And it's a fake. It's a fake video, fake audio, but it's in his voice. It's his face. And this is how far we've come with tech. You can already do this type of thing. And I want you to go check it out. It's only like a minute or so long um, because it makes it very clear that the idea of voice synth, which I've talked about before, and the company Liabird.ai that I've spoken about before. Uh, this is already happening. This is almost here. And I absolutely believe you will be able to license voices to do your audiobook. So a kind of AI slash licensed voice product um, within a couple of years. And I fully want you to be able to license my voice for your audiobook. Uh, that is kind of one of my goals. So I reckon it'll happen. And uh, I've mentioned this before, but the Sleepwalkers podcast, I absolutely think is a must listen to understand where we are uh, in this world of AI right now. So I am, as I said, I've, I am excited. I'm positioning for the next wave, which I really believe is coming. The disruption, I don't even think the disruption has started yet. <laughs> But I am positive and happy about it. As you can hear, I'm, I'm positively giddy about the things to come. I think I haven't been this excited for a long time about things because I, I feel oh, I just hate when things get stagnant. And last year I, I was starting to feel like, oh, where is this going? I just don't want it to be crank out more books plus advertising. That is just not satisfying. So what is coming that's more creative, that's more interesting? And uh, this to me is fantastic. So I will obviously get into much more detail in the AI show I do in a couple of weeks time. So my personal update this week. So I've been narrating, I have in fact finished narrating successful self-publishing and uh, that will get mastered by the lovely Dan Van Workhoven who also does this podcast and we will get that out there as an audiobook. And I'm in my booth right now and it is a real pleasure to have my own space for recording don't think it's something posh, though. It is literally, I hired a carpenter to build me a frame and then I bought some audio blankets and they're held together with, you know, the bulldog clips thing and some shower curtain hooks. <laughs> this is, I mean, the pro studios are like five and a half grand in pounds, so like 8,000 US, uh, 7,000, 8,000 US. And um, this was £500. <laughs> so I'm really happy with that investment in my voice studio. I will be doing a blog post on that um, once the audiobook is ready. Another decision I've made, finally, I've been flirting with this idea for a whole year. I have decided to stop my YouTube channel. Now, I'm not going to take it down or anything. And I will maybe still do occasional videos, but I'm not going to be doing this show on YouTube. I've been, I have been putting my interviews on YouTube for 10 years. And what I found is the views have just got less and less and less. And uh, it's never been my favorite medium. I'm not a video. I don't actually consume video. I never watch YouTube. I know it's a massive market, but it's not me. So I feel like we have to double down on what we love. And for me, it's voice first. So I've resisted this for like a whole year because of the sunk cost fallacy, which is I've spent so much time doing this, I must keep doing it. And uh, I have now got over that. So yay. <laughs> bye bye, YouTube. Uh, so a challenge for you there. Um, what can you cut out that will give you time to focus on what you enjoy and what you think will will be effective? Uh, both of those things. And I, I cannot win at YouTube no way can I win. And what I mean by win, I don't mean number one. I just mean I can't even, well, I don't even want to spend time on YouTube, uh, whereas I spend all my time, as I said, listening to stuff. So yeah, that's a decision for me. Uh, but yeah, the challenge for you is, are there things where you've got the sunk cost fallacy that you're like, oh, well, I've spent so much time and energy in this, thus I must continue. 
I also wanted to mention another hard decision I have made in the last week. So my mum, uh, my mum was on the show on episode 390 last year, and we talked about the three books we did together as Penny Appleton, so sweet romance books. My mum uh, wanted to write books. She loves sweet romance. So those are the books she wrote, not my natural genre. <laughs> but I helped her write those three books. I, I pretty much co-wrote them. I edited them. I published them. We did them together. And uh, then last year in episode 390, we talked about that I just, both of us kind of felt that I had launched her in a good way and she was ready to go it alone. And also I didn't want to do sweet romance anymore. So Penny Appleton is not an active brand. It's just an author name. Um, and we don't do any marketing as such. We don't have an email list. Um, we have a static website. But essentially, it is, I don't have the bandwidth for it. And I explained that to mum and said, like, are you OK with that? And she's like, yeah, fine. I just love to write. So uh, I am still helping her publish. I'm doing that technical side. But uh, she's doing all the writing. So what has happened is she's just given me her new Penny Appleton, which I've just published. So it's called Love at the Summerfield Stables, and it's in ebook print and large print. And what I thought was, I am not doing justice to what I would do with someone else. If you came to me and said, this is the situation with my mum, who's in her 70s, she doesn't want to do any marketing, she's barely on the internet, she just wants to write and put books up and point to them on Amazon and say, here's a book I made and have a copy on her shelf. And if she makes a bit of money, awesome, uh, so she can go on holiday, you know, whatever, to add to her pension. But if I, if you came to me and said that about your mum, I would say just put it on Amazon, go Kindle Unlimited, because it's the most simple way to publish. So even though I d a couple of weeks ago did a big show on going wide with self-publishing, I am putting the penny books into KU because of this inability to do other forms of marketing. So my active brands, Joanna Penn and JF Penn, are wide, uh, still happily wide as per that show. But um, once I withdraw the penny books from wide, they will go into KU. Um, so that's my reasoning. And part of me is kind of, oh, I don't want to do that. But then the other part of me is, as I said, if it was anyone else's mum, I would do that. So I want the best for my mum. And if she can make just a bit more money... Um, you know, because if you go wide, you really do have to concentrate on marketing to those other platforms as well as Amazon. So anyway, I wanted to talk about that. Um, and if you are in that situation and you don't have the bandwidth for all the other things, then, you know, fair enough. I get it. And I will continue to be wide for uh, all my other books, but Penny will be KU. So there you go. And you can always check out Penny Appleton if you enjoy sweet romance. OK, and then finally, I'm off to Spain for my dad's 70th birthday this week. So I'm the eldest of five siblings um, from two different uh, marriages. My dad's so ha some half sisters, half brother. Um, and we are all hanging out for a week. So this may be absolutely fantastic or could be one of those family drama situations. <laughs> but certainly Sun, Sea, Sangria and lots of listening to more podcasts and audiobooks. And I have a lot of books on my reading list for my week away. So very excited about that. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Uh, Laurel, Laurel Wanro says, I'm listening to the crime episode while oiling the cabin that has been in my family since my dad and his parents built it in the 1950s. I need to listen to a number of episodes. <laughs> for sure, Laurel, that looks amazing. Lovely picture of the cabin there. Uh, Imogen Clark says, uh, I love the podcast. It's like a shot in the arm on a Monday morning. And today, Joanna is absolutely buzzing. <laughs> I wish there were more people in my life with her enthusiasm and joie de vivre. And yeah, indeed, I am as a, you know, I just cannot contain my excitement at the moment. I'm so excited about life and voice stuff and telling stories in a new way. Oh, so many things. I think it's just because I love learning as well and I'm learning so much right now that uh, I just feel like all the gears are oiled and spinning and that is fun. 
Uh, and then、uh, Lynn says about Toby Neal, Toby's primary desire to always have the reader in mind really resonated with me. I think this is so important to keep the book from becoming far more than a recollection of memories. Having recently completed a next steps in fiction writing, I realised I'm hiding behind my fiction, and it's a memoir I should be writing. Well, that's so interesting, Lynn. And again, that's part of the reason I've started the Books and Travel podcast. And if you enjoyed Toby's show, she's actually on Books and Travel right now. You can go、uh, find books. Just search Books and Travel podcast on whatever you're listening on. Uh, and uh, or if you're listening on Alexa, you can say、uh, you can say、um, Alexa, play Books and Travel podcast, and it should happen. <laughs> Uh, so yes, and Toby is on that show with a different perspective. That show is aimed at just you know travel, interesting travel tips, and talking about Hawaii much more in detail about Hawaii. So、uh, if you fancy Hawaii, check that out. So today's show is sponsored by Ingram Spark, who I use to print and distribute my print-on-demand books to thirty-nine thousand retailers, including independent bookstores, schools, universities, libraries, and more. So why do print books if you don't do print already? Well, firstly, because we love books, and you want to say I made this,、uh, and readers love them. So I've just、uh, I'm going to do a blog post on this, but I've just done my end of year, and 22 percent of my book sales income this year are from print books, and. That has is con- considerable growth over the last couple of years, and that has all been through Ingram Spark. So、um, you can do hardback editions as well as large print, and all different sizes of paperback, as well as things like mass market paperback editions. So yes, you can use KDP Print to make your books available on Amazon. But if you only do that, you won't be able to reach bookstores, universities, schools, libraries. Because first of all, Ingram Spark gets you into the catalogues that those services search for, but also enable you to offer discounting. So if you think about the business model of, say, a bookstore, you have to discount because they buy the book at a discount and then they sell it at a certain retail price, and the difference. Is how they make a living. So, you, if you're not offering discounting, you cannot sell to these type of places. You can also do bulk sales and bulk purchasing at reduced prices if you are a speaker or if you're speaking at an event, or if you want to sell to schools, for example, as discussed with Dave Hendrickson in episode 377, where he talks about a business model of exactly this: bulk sales into schools through Ingram Spark. So, since being with Ingram Spark over the last couple of years, my print sales have more than doubled, and my books have been available in bookstores like Blackwell's. In In Edinburgh, Scotland, and at literary festivals, and that's pretty super exciting. So Ingram Spark have a lot of help on their website, and also a great podcast with tips at Go Publish Yourself available in all the usual places. So it's your content. Do more with it through IngramSpark.com. So this corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription, and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my patrons. So you can support the show on Patreon. And thanks to those new patrons this week,、uh, Croak, I think that is Croak or Croak. <laughs> Great name and A Howard, and I really do appreciate the support on Patreon. Like your tweets and emails, it demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue. And you can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month、uh, or a couple of coffees a month if you're feeling generous, and you'll get the extra monthly Q and A audio, which I'm just about to record as this goes out. So、uh, you can support the show at Patreon.com. P R T R E O N dot com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get on with the interview. Today, I'm back with Jim Cookroll. Hi, Jim. Hey, how you doing, Joanna? 
I am good. Just a little introduction. Jim Kukro is the author of 14 nonfiction books, an international professional speaker, consultant, and co host of the Sell More Book Show podcast. His latest book is Your Journey to Becoming Unskippable in Your Business, Life, and Career, which is fantastic. And I've just read it myself. Uh, so, Jim, I wanted to ask you you've written a lot of books over the years, and I have been following you since Attention, This Book Will Make You Money back in 2010. So you're a successful entrepreneur. Why this book now? You know, it's funny. I don't think I could have written this book uh, years ago, even two years ago, because of some experiences I had in my life and just the mental place that I'm at, because this book right now is more of a mindset book uh, than attention. Attention was more, you know, marketing and, you know, business stuff. And this has elements of that in it, but I try to work in a lot of, um, stuff about mindset and where you want to be in your life and, and, and try to weave all those things together, which is why I think it's applicable for authors, uh, as well as plumbers, right? So, (laughs) um, there's a, there's a lot of different things in this book. So the why was really because I made a really dumb mistake in my life a couple of years ago. I decided to run for political office in the United States of America, right about the time when social media had reached this pinnacle of, you know, divisiveness and the, everyone was so negative and angry and it became something that almost ruined my businesses, almost ruined my marriage, almost ruined uh, my health, uh, almost ruined my relationships with my friends and my family to the point where it like almost completely broke me being elected and, and, I kind of had to change the way I think, but I also learned a lot about people because marketing yourself to people, like when they, when they vote for you, they're buying you. It's like not steak sauce, right? Like if, if you market steak sauce, right? Uh, if the people don't buy your steak sauce, they just don't buy it. But when you lose an election and when people come at you and, and don't buy you, it's a much bigger hit on your ego, uh, to feel like people, oh man, they hate me. They didn't vote for me. So I won the first election, lost the second one. And I've been slowly climbing out of this hole for a couple of years. And that's when the idea for unskippable came about. Mm, it's so interesting. And a couple of questions off that. So you've obviously written a lot of nonfiction. So have I, and there's a ton of nonfiction books out there on all kinds of topics, but your personal story and your honesty and transparency in your experience there, which I didn't know about. I mean, I had some inkling of it, but it was fascinating to read your story more than anything. So how important is this kind of authenticity and honesty in writing nonfiction now? And and where do you draw the line? Well, look, I mean, Joanna, you and I both know we monitor what's selling, you know, selling books is a business, right? So you can see the trends of what genres are hot, what books are selling. If you look back at the last couple years, you will see that there are certain types of books in the nonfiction space that are doing really, really well. And they're like, I I hate to call them self-help books, but they're books that are motivational, inspirational, self-help type of books. Girl, wash your face. Go unblank yourself. Uh, you are a badass at, you know, whatever. Those types of books right now are resonating with people uh, where they didn't used to be so as much because there's just been a mindset change in how people think, react to other people and businesses. And that's really what Unskippable is about. It's about understanding what people are looking for in today's day and age, because everything changed, everything changed overnight. It's not like it used to be. There's the people are, are thinking differently than they used to be. They, they want to support businesses that, um, share social causes with them and they want to ban companies that they disagree with. And that's really what this book is all about is, is understanding how everything has changed. And that goes for you as an author as well. And to back to your original question, the transparency and the authenticity is so important nowadays. When you look at authors like uh, Cecilia Mecca, who has a wonderful Instagram account and she shares her life on there and she builds this tribe of people who really care about her, not just her books. And Joanna, you've been doing this forever. I mean, you've been podcasting about this industry longer than I have, and I've been doing it over five years. You understand that people want to get in and see who the real person is. So that makes a lot of sense to me, and that's what people want nowadays. 
Yeah, I totally agree. And and in fact, that's what we remember. Um, you know, we remember those personal stories and it makes you like a real person more than anything else. So uh, let's get into the book then, because the word unskippable is an interesting choice. So I want you to start by say, uh, talking about how has the world become skippable and why does that matter for authors? <laughs> Well, look, the the world has become skippable. I mean, DVRs allow us to fast forward through the commercials. Uh, when you're watching a show on Netflix or Amazon Prime, uh, as soon as the show ends, they give you like five seconds where you can click the button to start the next show because who could wait five seconds for the next show to start, right? I mean, we're being bombarded more than ever with ads and content marketing, which I still, content marketing still adds as far as I'm concerned. And you know, we're just being hit every single moment of the day and we're more distracted than ever. And, you know, my first book, Attention, which is nine years old now, was really uh, about that topic. So I try not to cover too much of that. We, we, we don't really have an attention problem nowadays. We just have a problem with trying to decipher through all of the content that's being thrown at us and then figuring out which ones we want to pay, pay attention to. So in this really complex world, how do you get someone to pay attention to you? I mean, did you know that um, most college students and younger people watch television or Netflix? I'll just I'll put Netflix in with television. Mm -hmm. They watch it with the closed captioning on. Yeah, I, I did know that. And it, that's really interesting. Um, and also the double screen thing. I do this myself. I've heard you talk about this and you say like your kids do this. I do this. I sit watching Netflix and I sit with my phone in my hand. <laughs> Well, that's exactly right. And the reason they watch it with cap captioning on it is because they say they can retain more of the information. So, you know, in, in, and, I, and I make this, this case in the book. It's like, be honest with yourself. When was the last time you sat down and watched a show or something and you didn't have your phone or your tablet on your lap? that you checked while you were watching it. That's the world we're living in now, living in now. And that's why you have to learn how to become unskippable because the, our minds are just being distracted by so much stuff. Here's what's interesting about that though. It, we, we are distracted more than ever. However, once we find content that we love, we will consume it voraciously. Mm. So once we're into it, once we get past that, you know, pushing the stone over the hill and we get somebody into our content, which is why it's so important for authors, because this is a show about authors, right? Which is why it's so important. And you know this to have multiple books, because if you only have one book and somebody reads it and then they're like, oh, okay, well, now what? When you finish a show on Netflix and it's over and you're like, that was amazing. You're depressed. You're like, <laughs> oh my gosh, what am I going to watch now? So you go to social media and you're like, hey, well, I just finished watching uh, this show. What do you guys recommend? You see that post every single day on Twitter and Facebook. And the same thing happens with authors. You know, they, they start to read the book and then there's nothing thereafter. And they're like, okay, now what do I read? So they try to go find somebody else. It's very important to have multiple books. Mm, I think that's part of the binge culture idea. And in fact, uh, Game of Thrones is a good example. We didn't watch it live, but we were so happy to watch it in a, in a binge, like over two nights. We just binged the whole of the final series of Game of Thrones. And actually, it was far more satisfying to just watch it in that binge way. And it's the same with books, as, as you say. So apart from having multiple books, what are some of the other ways that authors can become unskippable? Well, look, I mean, I kind of mentioned it a little bit here, but, you know, unskippable people ship product and skippable people perfect. Okay. This is a business. This is the author business. And when you can put out good quality content consistently, you're going to have a much better time of being successful than people who are just, you know, only getting a couple done a year because they're sitting around and they're perfecting. Um, I understand it's very difficult to write really great content uh, over and over at a fast pace. But if you really look at the authors that are doing really well, um, you're, you're going to see that they're, they're finding ways to do that. So finding a way to get that content out and have it uh, a book launch every two months or every month. In some cases, we just did a, a story on our, on my podcast with Brian the other day about somebody who's putting out a book every single month. You know, Jamie Albright's another great uh, author. Um, she can't write fast, but she's putting out consistent amount of works 
and she's putting them out uh, good quality work. So shipping your product instead of perfecting your product definitely makes you unskippable. The, the second thing for authors that I really think is a, a, a huge thing is the cover to market strategy. I can't tell you, and you know this, Joanna, that I can't tell you how many authors I run into who just want to try and do a different cover. Like they're writing a legal thriller. So they think, oh, well, everybody has a gavel and a scales of justice on it and a silhouetted protagonist. So I'm going to go do something different. Well, that line of thinking doesn't usually work, right? Because if you love legal thrillers and you read them voraciously and then you start to go look for the next one and you find a cover that doesn't look like the other ones, your, your brain says to you, oh, well, that's really not like the one I just read, which I love, so I'm just going to skip it. So resist the urge to try and do something different. It does work every once in a while, but in a general sense, if you're not doing a cover-to-market strategy, uh, I think that's going to hurt you long run. Mm. It's interesting you say that, and this is something I've gone on about for years, is that we should be able to upload different covers for different markets. Because if you compare an American book cover even to a British one, let alone to a cover that works in India, for example, or Asia, where the covers are very different, uh, you know, we should be able to have the same book, but different covers per market. In the same way, uh, back on Netflix, they actually show different images depending on who you are. So you might see uh, a series with a male protagonist uh, on the screen and I might see the female, the main female character. And th so it's kind of convincing us that it's maybe a slightly different thing. But isn't that interesting that this, you know, this perception, as you say, is so fast that there has to be an image that portrays what people are looking for? Well, look, that's what this book is about. The, the distraction that everybody has, you know, we spend an average of three hours a day looking at our phones, not talking on them. Okay. So we, these are little devices that are sitting in our pockets or our purses or on our countertops that we don't use as phones. We use them as browsers. We use them as to text, right? We use them and, and these little devices make it more and more difficult to get uh, the attention of people. You know, most of the mobile browsing or most of the browsing that people use on social media, like 80% is on a phone, right? And how do you re how do you get through to those people? And especially little tiny thumbnails on Amazon for your book cover and things like that. You have to be able to do be something different. So the cover is like just one of those little things. But in terms of an author, you know, being unskippable, obviously writing great content and producing it more quickly is something that's going to make you more unskippable. Mm. So let's come to audio because I, I, I must admit to being uh, attached to my phone. It is right here. It's in my hand right now as we talk. I mean, you know, I have it right by me, but I don't talk on the phone at all, like pretty much hardly ever, except to my mum, like once a week. But today I listened to almost an hour of audio. I listened to uh, a, a podcast and I listened to uh, an audio book as I walked around town and did did some chores and things like that. So for me, even though I skip some things, I am deep diving on audio. So you and I have been podcasting for years. You have an AI assisted audio business. So what about voice? How do voice and audio help authors become unskippable? Well, absolutely. It's the fastest growing market in publishing is the audio market. The problem, as you and I both know and have spoken privately about, is that it's cost prohibitive and time prohibitive to produce audio. And until uh, the technology catches up where it's easy to create AI powered audio that's closer to a human narration, we're still going to have these problems. Um, so there will be a time when that comes and you'll see in my estimation through the research I've done, one to 3% of all books on the internet are in audio one to 3%. That's it. And it's probably closer to the 1%. So think about that. There are, let's say there are 10 million, you know, 20 million books online. That's not a lot of audiobooks because it just takes forever to produce them. So that is absolutely the future. And that is absolutely where people are going to go. The, the thing about audio, though, is that there are people listening to this right now who are listening to this at two times speed, right? Because this goes, goes back to my original point. Just because it's audio, it's still another piece of content. And people, look, People want to find ways to skip things. They, their brain says, I'm busy. 
I've got other things to do. I've got to go do this. I need to find a way to skip that. And one of those ways is they'll say, I'll turn the, uh, the speed up on this podcast to two times. I know it's going to make them sound like chipmunks, but I'm going to get through this content faster because I have other things to do. And they're probably, while they're listening to this, they're probably checking email, checking Instagram, uh, whatever else they're doing. Rarely does anyone sit and uh, listen to a piece of content or read a piece of content all just at that one time, like I was talking mm. about before. Yeah, I, well, I disagree on that. As someone who, uh, in Europe, I think we walk a lot more than Americans. I, that is a massive statement. But, you know, American ha Americans have a lot of cars. So a lot of Americans are listening to audio in while driving. Um, while I think uh, a lot of the emails I get and a lot of tweets about people listening to this show, people are at the gym, they are walking, or they are doing chores. So they are doing something physical, say, with their hands or with their legs, so that they can't necessarily skip. So I agree with you on the speed because I listen to on 1.5 um, speed for both audio and audio books and podcasting. But I don't think that's skippable. I think that's just because my brain can go that fast. And over time, you can move it up. I know uh, someone who well, listens much, at a much faster speed. Uh, and I, I have a, a, a friend who's blind who listens at a speed that you and I couldn't even uh, understand. So I think that's not the same as being unskippable. I think that, or skippable, I think that is just a way of consuming. Absolutely. But I would push back a little bit and say, how much are you really retaining though, if you're speeding things up? And let's face it, even if you're at the gym, there's 30 screens on the television of different news channels and sports that you're dealing, you're looking around. In a general sense, though, I mean, it's not like it used to be where we would sit down and consume a piece of content. We'd set, sit in front of the TV set at eight o'clock to watch this show because there was nothing else to distract us in a general sense. So there aren't a lot of people in the world who can really retain information as much uh, as they as they want to with all of these different things coming. And that's kind of so I agree with you and disagree with you. Yeah. OK, we'll leave it with that. <laughs> But um, I do want to ask about book marketing with audio because my feeling is, I mean, again, this is the type of consumer I am. I don't read blog posts anymore. I read books and I, I listen to audio books and I listen to podcasts. So m most of my uh, nonfiction book recommendations come from podcasts. So for me, that voice is uh, not just content production as such, it's also book marketing. So I wonder with Unskippable, uh, how much, what are you doing with the book marketing? How much are you focusing on podcasting and how much should authors think about that? Yeah. So I've got a podcast that is associated with it and I launched it a couple months ago and I'm going to retool it now, but, uh, the audio is going to be a big part of the book marketing for this. I'm recording my own audio book. I'm going to use find away voices for that. And, uh, I'm going to, you know, go wide, right? I'm going to try Like, I know you recommend people to go wide, I'm going to try and go wide with the audiobook at first and not get stuck into like a seven year contract with Audible and uh, kind of do it on my own. The problem with book marketing and audio is like since Audible kind of controls that space, they give you such limited ability to promote your book. I mean, I think they give you what, like 20 coupon codes or something like that. Um, maybe it's 10. I don't even know. So, and, and they don't really, and of course, they control the price. Right. And there's, so there's so many things that you can't do to market your book in audio form because you're stuck in an ACX contract. And that's why I'm going to go with Find Away Voices. So I have way more control. Mm. Um, OK, so let's just talk about the business angle, because, uh, you know, you and I both believe in multiple streams of income and there is an ecosystem that you can build around a book. So I wondered, wh what is the ecosystem you're going to build around Unskippable, uh, which may include speaking, for example? Yeah, speaking, I'm definitely uh, is what I'm focusing on for this. Um, I uh, had younger kids in the last uh, 10 years and I didn't want to be away from them. So I stopped going on the road and now I'm back to the point where, you know, they're in high school. One's going to graduate next year. And I'm like, all right, I want to get back on the road. So this book is really about getting myself back on the road and using it as a business card. And I want to go out and inspire and teach people and help them to think differently and, and help them to build better businesses and become entrepreneurs and things like that. So 
this is absolutely a speaking thing. I model myself after a speaker by the name of Andrew Davis, who is an amazing keynote speaker, uh, the best I've ever seen. And he's doing three to four gigs a month. He's traveling all around the world. You know, he's in Prague last week. You know, he's, he's all over the place. And he only has, I think, three books. But what he really did is folk, he uses, let me put it to you this way. Books used to be the biggest thing you needed to be a professional speaker. Now you can get away with having a book is is an add on to that, but it used to be such a big thing. Like if you didn't have a book, you couldn't be a speaker. Nowadays, if you're a great speaker, you don't have to have a book. So I'm really going to use this book as a business card to get myself back out on the road and speak. Mm. (coughs) Sorry. Uh, (coughs) Just a, cut that out. (laughs) Um, So really interesting there, because speaking can be the way to make the most money when you're a nonfiction author. So is that is that the plan is unscapable, like you said, a business card? Or are you also looking to do consulting? Are there other products? So how is that ecosystem going to work with all your other business ventures? Because you're a busy guy. Well, listen, I still get leads from attention, the book I wrote nine years ago. Right. You know, I, I'll tell you a story about a lead I got from that book. Uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, somebody read the book like seven years after it came out. At the end of the book, they got to my back matter and they saw that they could contact me through my website. They contacted me. We had a conversation. Uh, I ended up going into their office, talking with the CEO of the company. They booked me to speak for an hour. They booked me to do a workshop after, and then I ended up getting a six-month consulting contract at $5,000 a month. So I don't need to sell Seth Godin amount of books or Mark Dawson or Joanna Penn, Joanna Penn level amount of books because my business is getting in and getting speaking gigs and consulting from the books. Um, and I make more money doing it that way in nonfiction indirectly from the books, the business around a book. Mm, yeah, and we both agree on that. I mean, I I think uh, a lot of the times the nonfiction ecosystem is what makes it so powerful. Uh, you know, whether that's products or affiliate income or you know consulting or all those other things. So uh, yeah, that's fantastic. I did want to ask you about speaking. Um, you spoke at the obviously the Sell More Book Show Summit, which was uh, your conference, your and Brian conference this year, and you mentioned that you got really good uh, response to a ten minute talk. Now, this is really interesting to me because I, I've i been doing uh, speaking for years and generally I only do really long talks, like I'll do a full day. So I struggle, you know, I, I struggle to go from a full day to a 10 minute. So what what is the key to going from a content speaker, like a teacher, to being a keynote speaker, which I presume is what you are now doing? Well, look, the keynote speakers are the ones who get paid, right? The, mm. the business of speaking is the, peop- the people who get paid are the entertainers. The people who don't normally get paid are the ones who do the 30-minute sets that where they have the top 10 tips to something, right? The educational stuff. Though They don't really pay those speakers nowadays. The people who make, like Andrew Davis, who probably makes $25,000 a keynote, he's 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 informing people, but he's entertaining people. So if you want to make money as a speaker, you have to be you have to be a keynote speaker, which is where you 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 actually entertain people, make them laugh, your draw, all of those things. So um, it's different, right? So if you just want to be on the road and and do conferences and trade shows and stuff like that, in today's speaking world, they normally don't give you any money for that kind of stuff anymore. You want to get uh, – there's two different types of speakers. There's paid speakers and then there's people who just do it for the fun of it and just do it for leads for their business, which which are both great. But I want to be – I eventually want to be Andrew Davis. I want to be the guy who they bring in for the final closing keynote that people are wowed by. But that takes years. Mm-hmm. It's like a – I mean, it's like a stand-up comic. You have to spend so much time and effort honing your craft and having that perfect talk, just like writing a great book. I mean, you can't just mail it in. It takes years of practice, uh, but it can be very lucrative if you can do it. And that's mm. my – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get there eventually. Yeah, and, and if you enjoy it as well, uh, which I think is the interesting part. I think it's uh, you have to love 
doing that. So you do mention in the book, uh, you talk about joyful experiences as highlights for being unskippable. Uh, and I will be joining you, I'm very excited, at the Career Author Summit in Nashville in May 2020, when I will be doing a content talk, and I hope you're going to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what are what are some of the reasons that authors should consider in person events? I mean, attending them, uh, you know, even if they are introverts. Okay, so there, I read about this in the book. Uh, there, it says there's a poll that says the average American hasn't made a real friend in five years, <laughs> but we have all of these Facebook friends, right? And what we've done now is we have supplant, uh, sub replaced our social media friendships with real friendships, at least here in the United States, according to this poll. Of course, this is not true for every single person. But in a general sense, you know, the study, they, these people did a study, a 75-year study on people, and they said that friendships are really what makes us happy. OK, so when we think about where we're at, this vicious circle now where we have, oh, we have friends on social media and friends on Twitter, these aren't really our real friends, right? They're people we may have known, I mean, and associates and things like that, but they're not the person you call when you get put into a Tijuana jail at four in the morning and somebody needs to come <laughs> and bail you out, right? You know, so we've gotten to this vicious circle of replacing our uh, friends, our real friendships with these virtual friends. and. Getting back to the joyful experiences, joyful experiences are really powerful, okay? Uh, banks are a great example, okay? When I, I'm 47 years old, so I grew up in, in an age, and I don't know how it is in Europe, but in the United States, when you walk into a bank, it's like walking into a secure vault. There's lines and, you know, there's a security guard standing at the door and, you know, you feel intimidated when you walk into a bank, but that's, again, that's all changing. You know, Capital One is completely redesigning all of their banks. And instead of it being like the old version of a bank with the big columns and the security guards, it's like a coffee shop. You walk in now and there's free Wi-Fi and couches and friendly people at the counter because they understand that it's about the joyful experience for somebody. If you're a 25 year old ready to choose a bank that you're probably going to bank with for the rest of your life, are you going to your parents' bank or are you going to the one that's more like the coffee shop where people are friendly and they make it easy and I can sign up online and it's this whole thing. Joyful experiences are what drive people. When we don't have things to look forward to, we get depressed. And if you are running a business and you are creating friction and, and you're not creating joy with people during your process or your email sign up or whatever else you do, if you're bothering them, they're not going to pay attention to you. They're not going to become lifetime loyal customers if you are not creating joy with them. And that's something that I think uh, I need. I want to try to get through to every single person who reads this book is you really need to think about how you're interacting and what joyful experiences you're creating for your readers. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. And that emotional resonance actually goes back to the keynote speaking as well. Uh, you know, it's often... I've looked at my notes after a talk that I thought was amazing and didn't write anything down or, you know, or wrote like one ridiculous phrase down, but I felt good. Um, and that people remember that emotion and they're like, that was, that speaker was amazing. They were the best speaker, uh, even, you know, because of how they, they felt um, afterwards, I guess. And I did want to come back on um, banking because here in Europe, certainly I'm sure it's the same in America. Um, the biggest growth in banking is uh, online apps. Like people don't even go into a bank anymore <laughs> and all the banks are closing. <laughs> well, I write about that in the book too. People look, people don't want to leave their house anymore, right? There's a, there's a reason why car dealerships are going to be on the wayside in the future because companies like Carvana you go online, you find the car you want, you order it online, you get the financing online, and then they deliver it to like this big vending machine near your house. You walk up, you put your token in, and your car comes out and you drive it home. Why? Because a joyful experience is not having to deal with uh, a dealership, walking in and spending three hours on a Saturday talking to a car salesperson who has to go check with the manager and maybe I can get you a better deal. And then they put, you know, put some extra fees on it. People don't even want to leave their houses anymore. There's a company called Enjoy Technologies, 
And what they do is if you want to order an iPhone, you can go to a, a Apple store and wait in line and make an appointment, or you can go to an AT&T store or whatever, or you can order it online, or you can have enjoy technologies, order it online. They'll send somebody to your house, come into your house, set up your phone, transfer all your files and show you how to use the phone and unpack it for you in your house. Oh, and by the way, it's completely free. Mm. And that is a joyful experience. That is that is the expectation that the new consumer has moving forward from 2019. And that is why you see companies like Payless Shoe Source here in the United States closing because nobody wants to get in a car and drive to the store anymore when they have so many options and so many ways for to save their save themselves time and effort and money uh, where they don't have to do anything. And it's sad, but that's really the world we're living in now. And that's all these companies skippable and what makes these new companies that are disrupting that process unskippable. You know, I want to go back to this uh, joyful experience thing. Did you ever hear of the the KonMari method? Oh, yeah. I, I love her. I love right. her. She's amazing. So the basic, Marie Kondo. Yeah, right. yeah Marie Kondo. So the, the, it was a best-selling book. Then it was made into a Netflix show. And the entire concept, and I'll summarize it here just for the cliff note version, is if you are going through your material possessions in your life, if they do not bring you joy, get rid of them, right? And that mindset is taking hold to all kinds of people, not just younger people. It's doing their faster, but all throughout the world. That's the phenomena. That's the disruption that's happening. And people don't have time. Don't have the uh, don't want to put the effort into things that do not provide them joy any longer, and they are looking for the substitute to that. And when you're running a business, if you can figure out if if you first understand how people think, then you understand that that's why they think the way they do. Then you can change your business and change the way you interact with your customers or your readers, and you're going to have much more success going that uh, method. Create joyful experiences. Get rid of that friction that people uh, don't want to have because they, that's skippable to people. Mm, no, totally get that. Uh, very true. Okay, so uh, where can people find you and Unskippable and all your books and everything you do online? Uh, just go to jimkukrell.com or actually if it's easier to remember, just go to beunskippable.com, beunskippable.com. That'll take you right to my website. Um, and you can grab a copy of it. I'm really excited about this one. This is the best book I've written since attention. It's different. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a gold miner. I, I love gold mining, right? So, uh, I've never actually gold mined, but the analogy is I've written this book. It's got a lot of different thoughts in it. And I guarantee you that even if you're an author who writes, you know, romance or legal thriller or whatever, you're going to get inspired by this book. You're going to get you're going to pull at least one nugget of information, at least one. I guarantee you that you're going to go, wow, I think I could change the way I write or the change the way I run my business from this book. And that's what this book is all about. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Jim. That was great. Thank you, Joanna. It's always a pleasure to be on your wonderful show. And thank you for continuing to lead the way in the publishing space. You are an inspiration to everyone. And I can't wait to see you in Nashville. So I hope you enjoyed today's show and got some ideas about how to become unskippable. Jim and I, of course, discussed the importance of voice and next week's show will be interesting to those who want to take it further. I'm interviewing Lorelai King, who is a multi-award winning audiobook narrator and co-author of Storyteller, How to Be an Audiobook Narrator. And it is a brilliant audiobook and definitely worth getting on audio because Lorelai demonstrates all these different voice tips, which you can really only do with voice. It doesn't work on the page so much, although there is a Kindle transcript available as well. So I uh, pick Lorelai's brains about some of my questions. She is super knowledgeable. So that is coming up next week. Happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.